News. 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 New York City. FAQ NYC podcast getting more and more interesting by the minute. FAQ. It's FAQ NYC, the New Yorker's podcast from the newsroom by and for New Yorkers, the city. I'm Christina Greer here with Harry Siegel. Hello, Harry Siegel. Hello. I'm here to break down another jam-packed week in New York City. Harry, let's jump right in. Hey, Chrissy. So we have to start with some dark news from the Bronx this week with the one-year-old dead and three other tots hospitalized, including one in critical condition, after they were exposed to fentanyl in a Bronx daycare. The operator of the daycare, which just opened, in which state inspectors are given a clean bill of health just a week earlier, according to the city's health commissioner, and a tenant of hers, have been arrested and charged with murder showing depraved indifference. Elsewhere in the Bronx, a grandmother was shot and killed by a stray bullet while trying to cross the street, and five other bystanders, including an eight-year-old boy, were injured in what police believe may be a series of shootings related to a gang beef. Those headlines may feel like a uh, dark time warp to some New Yorkers. Speaking of time warps, Eric Adams gave the keys to the city, to Sean Combs, the artist who, back when he was known as Puff Daddy, in 1991, put on a badly oversold benefit show at City College, where nine attendees died in a stampede. Combs still went by Puff Daddy in 1999, when he and then-girlfriend Jennifer Lopez, whatever happened to her, ha uh-huh, were in the <laughs> VIP section of a nightclub where another patron allegedly threw money at him. Someone from their group started firing into the crowd. Combs and J-Lo fled the scene, were arrested with a concealed weapon in the ride. Bad boy artist Shine, last name Barrow, who was just 21 at the time, was eventually convicted of that shooting that injured three people, served most of his sentence, and converted to Orthodox Judaism while locked up before being deported on his release to his native Belize, where he's now the leader of the political opposition. Now Combs, who just, as we discussed on the pod, gave rights back to the artist he was accused for decades of screwing, is a certified prince of the city. More on that later. So, Harry, meantime, the chief of DACO, the medical services company that somehow scored a $432 million emergency contract from the city to provide services to migrants and is fishing for an even bigger contract from the feds, resigned following a Times Union story about how he lied about his resume. Hi, Melania. That, in turn, came after brutal coverage about the company's thuggish and inept, inept approach, an investigation into the company by State Attorney General Tish James, and an effectively symbolic refusal to sign off on their contract by City Comptroller Brad Lander, though Mayor Eric Adams said he stood by their work. And elsewhere, the city began a crackdown on Airbnbs. Love a good Airbnb, just not New York. Limiting most short-term rentals here and penalizing the booking platforms that nonetheless list them. They could end up being a boon to New Yorkers whose rent is too damn high by increasing the supply of apartments they could lease and is certainly a boon to the powerful hotel trades union and hotel owners who have also benefited in the city's recent states of emergency. First from the city paying to book thousands of their rooms, first for people with COVID, and now for migrants. Finally. The first mayor's management report, which is the rundown the city is legally required to put out each year about how all its departments are doing, to cover a full fiscal year under Mayor Eric Adams, showed some good signs, but also some really disturbing ones. Those include a big increase in the number of criminal summonses for so-called quality of life arrests, a trend first reported right here at this city, that the NYPD dubiously contends are the result of 311 calls and were necessary for, quote, law enforcement reasons. That big increase is despite a 2016 law effectively mandating that those crimes mostly result in civil summons. By the way, the crime rate continued to fall for years after that law was passed, along with the number of criminal summonses, which, of course, have a much bigger effect on people's lives than the civil ones. The MMR also showed the police response times including for critical crimes in progress, are up significantly again from last year and way up nearly 50% over the last five years. The city's ability to deliver food stamps and cash aids to a new applicant in a timely fashion has collapsed under the Adams administration, going from about a 90% on-time approval rate to about 30%. And to take our intro, sadly, full circle, 
The report lists a record 2,668 fatal overdoses in the past year, up nearly 85% from 2018, and, of course, exceeding the peak number of murders as well that uh, New York has ever experienced. So, Chrissy, that's an awful lot popping. What's top of your mind on this rainy Monday? Maybe something a little more cheerful. Yeah, Harry, let's, let's, you know, I like to end the podcast on a bright note, but maybe we should start it on a bright note. Um, I'm just so impressed. The city published this link last week um, about the fall foliage report, and I've been texting it to anyone and everyone who lives anywhere near New York. Um, it's iloveny.com. And you can get the report. Listen, Massachusetts has autumn on lock. Okay, we get it. New England, there's there's nothing like New England. I used to mail my grandparents leaves in Florida um, just because the trees were so incredible and the colors were so bright and vibrant. I would literally collect leaves, put them on a brown paper bag, make a card and mail them <laughs> to the state of Florida. But I will say New York in September and October and, and parts of November. It's just magical. I mean, there's a reason why Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong are singing about it, right? So on a bright note, before we get into all that is not working, what is working is nature is amazing. You all know that like I'm half a hippie and we need to just be hugging these trees as the leaves sort of gracefully caress the ground. It's it's beautiful. And this report on iloveny.com really just it shows you where there's no change midpoint change and where it's at peak but it's the entire state um so for people who are trying to you know get up north to the hudson valley or the catskills or you know finger lakes region whatever you feel like doing it's it's fantastic that being said i don't know where to start harry do we start with you know children dying at a daycare, which is a parent's worst nightmare? Do we start with Puffy getting the keys to the city? I mean, I think that he's one of the shadier, more dubious characters in the entertainment world. So is it surprising that he gets a key to the city from this particular mayor? Or, you know, DACA, which I, I've spoken about on the pod before. I had issues that they sort of came to be without any um, competition. You know, I don't like a no-bid contract at all. It makes me very unsettled. And then lastly, I, I briefly retweeted someone who, who tweeted about this earlier in the week. I don't understand how we go from a 90% approval rate when it comes to people's food stamps and benefits to barely pushing 30%. I mean, we know that so many people are living check to check. And that's not even people who rely on government assistance. That's just for regular New Yorkers themselves. I literally, you know, we're having this conversation yesterday. I can't tell if we're just older and these are the things that we gripe about, you know, like we're in our forties now. So do we just complain about long lines and, you know, music is trash and all this other stuff, or is it really that things are getting expensive? No matter how much you make, you're feeling a pinch you know, the economy may be doing well, but that's not necessarily a pocketbook translation, right? So yes, Joe Biden, you're doing a great job. Shout out to you. You're saving us from a financial cliff, as Democrats tend to do after Republicans mess up the funds and, you know, rip out the social safety net. So on a higher level, sure, the economy is look, is trending upward, but that's not translating to people's pocketbooks necessarily. And so for people who rely on cash benefits, for that to be late, I mean, there was a, a time not very long ago where it's like if Fordham was ever late with a paycheck, we would have had a serious problem over here. So the the fact that the city of New York isn't on time with their bills lets me know that there's a larger administrative issue going on, which goes back to like the fundamental question we ask almost every week. It's not just the mayor. Who is around the mayor supporting the mayor who knows what they're doing? It's a really serious question. You know, just looking at the MMR and this points to an unprecedented and continuing increase in applications, fewer staff due to attrition and retirements, the expiration of New York State waivers, so on. Right. So so that's a a lot of words um and the number of people who are applying 
or cash assistance is up, but not insanely, basically from 580000 before the pandemic and staying right about there through FY 2022, which covers both de Blasio and Adams. Now it's 660000 in the first year at just Adams. And it's because a bunch of federal aid that came during the pandemic has gone away and is going away. In the meantime, the timely cash assistance rate went from 19, uh, 2019, 95%. Going forward, 92%, 95% again. FY22, which is de Blasio and Adams, down to 82%. FY23, 29%. That's brutal. Mm -hmm. Pretty much exactly the same for uh, food stamps. And so something has gone severely wrong here. And while Mayor Eric Adams keeps talking about migrants as the issue and the expense New York can't bear, uh, you know, uh, Independent observers like the IBO are like, wait, about half of the budget gap is from other things. It's from the contracts you just signed off on that didn't include efficiencies. And all this is happening while Adams is having this series of pegs, uh, plans to eliminate the gap that involve not filling vacancies. And you're starting to see the holes in the ways in which this seriously and severely affects New Yorkers. So somebody who who needs help now who didn't previously, right, who, who got through some of the pandemic and was okay or was getting it from somewhere other than the city, who needs this form of stability and clarity about their income, about how they can feed their family. Um, as the MMR puts it, this is the assistance that provides economic stability to support the basic needs of all eligible children and adults. Uh, the Adams administration is entirely failing to do that. And it's not because of some unprecedented surge in applicants here. It's not because of migrants. This is something that this administration needs to be right now held to account for. And up until this point has not. I will say that looking at the numbers in the MMR, I dug into last year that we're going badly in the wrong direction outside of response times from the police and the FDNY, which continue to not go where we want them to, right. that they did turn some of those around, or at least the problems peaked. So I'm hopeful that this pseudo exercise in transparency, and I say pseudo, Mike Bloomberg did a press conference about every MMR and talked about all the good indicators that were happening in this city. Eric Adams sends out an email at like 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m. on a Friday, and then like notes six things that are pretty okay, he thinks. He's like, hey, gun arrests are up 10%. Okay. Um, murders are down. Excellent. Um, and, and that's it. And then wants to say nothing further about this. Uh, you know, his take is that you can't win with these things. Um, and the press is always going to find the bad news and harp on that. Maybe that's right. But, uh, you know, Amero talks about showing up, about being a New Yorker, about getting stuff done. Do not, when, when all the numbers come out, say, look, here's what we're getting done. And answer questions about it and have uh, uh, knowledge and, and the full credible argument is distressing to me. And it suggests that a lot of this is borough presidency stuff. Is Trumpy stuff is just talking about how the challenges are extra big and unfair and the stuff we've done is unprecedented and historical without putting any heft or flesh behind that in a substantive way. These are the substantive numbers. This is like the big book of how New York is done. Right. And for him to dump that is distressing to me. Well, listen, we know what the job is. We do when we don't. Right. So we're always in unprecedented times. OK, population mm -hmm. increases. Right. The times always get way more complicated. This is why you ran for mayor and I didn't. Okay. That's why you have the job. I mean, I remember telling an administrator once when he was like, well, what do you, what should we do? I was like, this is why you get paid what you get paid and I get paid what I get paid. You're, you get paid what you get paid to, to figure this out, to solve this. Right. So this is the job. Now we're in the hard part. Right. When he asks, when does the hard part start? This is the hard part. This, the hard part has started. It's actually begun, sir. We're in it. So. And the numbers, you know, as someone who teaches stats, right? I don't believe the phrase, the numbers don't lie. We can, we can always lie about numbers. But these numbers, they may not be perfect, but they're damn sure not 90%. So if we were at 90 versus 85, it's like, well, you know, what are we going to do about the numbers? These numbers are now 90 to 30%. So something is amiss. Where is it amiss, right? We need to find where the leak in the pipeline is where the weakest links are, and why is it that families, who support you by and large, when you look at the data, why is it that they are last in line 
to get these services. Services that are desperately needed, because as I said before, if middle class folks are feeling the crunch, if upper middle class folks are feeling the burn, we know that folks that rely on these goods and services that are promised and owed to them, I do believe in the social safety net for a host of reasons, then they need to be there in a timely fashion because we know that this is, we know that New Yorkers and obviously Americans across the country, but New Yorkers especially are making these decisions. Do I pay my rent or do I eat, right? Do I keep my lights on or do I pay my phone bill so I can know where my kids are just in case something happens at school? I mean, these are real decisions that people are making. So it would be lovely if the mayor talked to folks, not just right-wing talk radio, but like talk to folks where you explain to us who's in charge. Because part of being an effective leader is also hiring people who know what they're doing. I mean, you know, I had issues with Michael Bloomberg. However, I do think that Michael Bloomberg was like, I don't know everything, right? I mean, he was the one who told people to buy a $5,000 bike when we're talking about transportation. He clearly doesn't know, right? He hired that, who was the woman he hired, the chancellor, who like patted that little black girl on her head and knew nothing about public school. You remember that woman? You must be thinking of Kathy Black. Kathy a publishing Black. publishing executive. <laughs> like Michael Bloomberg, sit down. Right. So clearly that was the decision where he was like, he woke up and was like, I think I know things. No, you don't. Right. But he met he, someone at a party and said, you will run the school system. Exactly. You had one glass of champagne too many. It was like, let's do this. So he then, you know, course corrects. But that was like a major faux pas. But we didn't wait too, too long. Now, granted, damage was done for sure. But he didn't keep her on for freaking two terms because she was an unmitigated disaster, right? Shout out to uh, FAQ guest Dennis Walcott, who now runs the Queens Library System, who dealt with the city council maps, and who came in and... uh... I mean, and, talk and, about cleanup, didn't know man. the system and, and, and got things going. But that, right. that was a deeply offensive move. I mean, beyond, right? And shout out to Gotham Book Prize. Dennis Walcott is my uh, fellow juror. Um, so I, I I say all that to say I I want like an org chart. I would love if the mayor sort of, you know, I'm a professor. You know, I love a, a, a good you know, interesting lecture. I would love it if the mayor sort of brought everybody together, right? Stakeholders, journalists, everything. And like gave us a 45 minute PowerPoint on like, here's who's running stuff. Here's what's going on. Here are all the people. Like you show me that you have your finger on the pulse, that these people have their finger on the pulse. Because you know, I have been very clear that I think that our current mayor is very good at politics. The policy piece, I'm still a holdout. But the politics piece, I think he's a very smart man. I think he understands New York incredibly well. But part of understanding New York is also understanding where it's like you're letting folks down. Things are falling through the cracks. The hard part has started. Like you are balancing a lot as Lyndon Baines Johnson told us he would never want to be mayor. This job is much harder than the presidency in a lot of ways. Nobody expects Joe Biden to solve issues in 24 hours. We all expect a mayor to solve issues in less than a day. So, and these are issues that he inherited um, financially. And he's got limited budget, right? He's got to constantly go to Kathy Hochul and, and Joe Biden with his tin can and, you know, sort of as every mayor does, do the little tap dance to see if you can get more coins. Knowing how upstate New Yorkers don't like us anyway, because they think that we, you know, suck all the resources, even though our tax base is the only thing holding this state afloat, clearly. So I wish that there was more communication, clear communication from the mayor, letting us know who is in charge with these particular issues and gaps. Who made the choice to have a no-bid contract for DACO? Who made that decision? Who brought him that paperwork and said, yeah, don't worry about it, right? Who made the decision to say like, oh yeah, well, you know, universal pre-K, it's like, we don't have as many signups, but, you know, we don't need to go into communities and like knock on doors literally and say like, hey, don't you have a kid? You need to sign this up. Because what we're finding more and more is that so many parents don't know about some of the goods and services that the city provides, of which there are many. 
And then Adams has used that, that parents aren't signing up for all these 3K slots to say, this isn't what we need to be doing. Implicitly, his argument is we don't need a universal subsidy. We need one for uh, low-income parents. But he's not explicitly doing that. He's just sort of sabotaging the program, which in relation to a couple other things you were saying there brings us to the bizarre New York Times, New Yorker, um, certain class Upper West Side, often white editor and nostalgia who are de Blasio's New York, where suddenly these places that were very suspicious of him, but are even more suspicious of Adams are constantly saying, well, de Blasio had a vision. He had pre-K. What's Adams doing? As if the circumstances in which they came in were vaguely comparable. Uh, de Blasio inherited a very healthy and growing city budget that had space for him to do this, even when, uh, Andrew Cuomo would not give him the tax that was supposed to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Adams is coming in at a time when much harder decisions have to be made. And we're questioning some of the ways he's making those. But let's not kid ourselves that these are easy or that they would be easy, even minus his projected $12 billion over three years to help house and otherwise support newly arriving migrants. One other thing I want to mention, speaking of org charts, it's been such a week we forgot to bring up in the intro so and this is not an inherited error eric ulrich former republican council guy uh then becomes a senior advisor to this mayor then becomes the buildings commissioner famously a role that's uh, susceptible to corruption and is supposed to protect the building industry from it turns out Uh, that he is under investigation. Allegedly, Adams tells him, Ulrich says, or told prosecutors, hey, be careful what you say on your phone. You're under investigation. Ulrich is very not careful on his phone, and among other things, with the bribes he's supposedly receiving, starting when he's a councilman and going straight through to when he's buildings commissioner, is this painting from a person who's been described as the last living disciple to Salvador Dali, but in fact died two years ago. I'm I'm speaking with... uh, the manager, his manager agent later today, because I'm fascinated by him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but his girlfriend wanted this painting. He gets this painting. They talk about it in moron code on their phone call. Hey, the thing, the, the drawing my daughter did. Do you have that sort of stuff? But get this. The New York Daily News says that his girlfriend is Rhonda Binda, who is the executive director of the Gracie Mansion Conservancy, right? Which is the nonprofit that maintains oh and deals with the mayor's official residence in Manhattan. Um, Social media posts seem to show they've been dating since at least 2020. Um, One of the indictments says they share him and his girlfriend in an apartment in Rockaway Park. No one suggested wrongdoing on her behalf. It's not clear if she actually got the painting. But what I'm going to say here is, guess when she was appointed the director of the Gracie Mansion Conservancy? And this just comes up in passing in this story. It is days after Ulrich resigns because he's under investigation. This is a $150,000 a year gig. So plainly, in my view, this appears to be Adams watching out for Ulrich and Ulrich's family's income after this happens. And when the charges first come out, Adams says, of course, I didn't know anything. This is ridiculous. Is this good, fellas? Would I have appointed someone if I knew this? And the answer just obviously is yes. And if you're handling your business, Everything in the city is running wonderfully. Yeah, you can have your guys come in, uh, make good livings. Um, You know, their their, their spouses and girlfriends get taken care of. and No one really cares. However, when there are all these questions about how you're doing and you're not in the fun part and you're doing those sorts of games and on so many levels. So after he resigns, after you say, you know, everyone in my administration will be held to the highest standards, you're finding a six figure job for his girlfriend. Something does not look or smell right. Well, so this is, I think this is the complicated piece. There are a few complicated pieces, Harry, because I've said this from day one, my level of discomfort with Eric Adams and who he surrounds himself with has always been a stickler, right? I mean, you can't hang out with shady characters for but so long before people think that you two are a shady character. The the timing of the girlfriend you know, is always the girlfriend. Whenever I think of girlfriends, I always think of, you know, Whitey Bulger's girlfriend, the one who's like getting her nails done. And 30 years later, now he's in the clink. Well, no, he was in the clink and then life caught up with him. But, you know, it's like just 
girlfriends. It's complicated. But I do think, you know, the timing is problematic. But zooming out 30,000 feet, this is where, to me, it's a little complicated just because so many people in the city are in two high power jobs. So it's like, well, is she not supposed to work because her boyfriend is who he is? I mean, that's the timing. Yes. Seems like shady boots, but the, the, whenever we start talking about like girlfriends and boyfriends and like, who's got what jobs I get a little, I think this is where my kind of gender identity Mm -hmm. comes to the fore because it's like, well, I mean, we've got, Banks and right, you know, we've we've had in in media, we've got lots of people who work for you know different outlets that there there could be some sort of not violations, but you know, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Conflicts of interest. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. So that one, I'm just like, yeah, I, I guess I think the timing is what makes it like, okay, yeah, you're right. But her just having that job. I'm like, well, I mean, no, what's she fine. supposed to do? That's yeah. totally fine. I'm just saying that the, the, the city reported this week, the news site, the city, that Ulrich never completed his city hall background check right. before the criminal probe. And the DOI is way behind on all these background checks. And I'm just saying this is a, uh, a, a an alcoholic, you know, um, who said so and, and you know, went, went to get help uh, in the middle of divorce with a gambling problem. Uh, who wrote a letter asking a judge to give leniency to a mob guy who now, you decided is going to be your uh, DOB commissioner? Like, Whose fault is it that these background checks are late? So, DOI, just, I mean, just it, it's, of, it's independent, but it's a city agency. So, okay. so this, Again. like like the, uh, the, the cash health applications, is fundamentally City right. Hall's responsibility. And they haven't been as independent as, as the agency was. Uh, under Bloomberg, and then actually under under DOI Commissioner Mark Peters when de Blasio was there. Right. So so it is a cozier relationship now, and it seems to be an underfunded operation that is struggling to just do that sort of due diligence, which maybe you don't want done, depending on who you're bringing in, but really is a way of covering your own backside to just right. have gone, gone through that and making sure. Now, has anyone written, Harry, before we get out of here, um, a real comprehensive reflection of the Bloomberg administration in the 12 years. I just feel like we were under such a post 9-11 haze for like the first half of it, economically and emotionally as a city. There were some things that he did. And I mean, there are ways that because of his largesse and quite honestly, generosity, he sort of got the city back up and running. And yes, he had his own vision, right? His public health vision. So that's when, Everyone had to stop smoking in restaurants and restaurant owners were like, what are you trying to do to us? And he's like, you'll thank me in the long run because you'll actually have customers who are alive to like come to your restaurant. So he had a vision, a personal vision that he imposed upon the city, you know, obviously bike lanes and sort of these ways that um, cars can't drive through certain streets. And, you know, you remember he was caught like (laughs) drinking wine in Central Park and it's like, hey, you can't drink alcohol in public. He's like, really? We do it all the time. It's like, right. Because you're Michael Bloomberg, but regulars can't just be drinking booze in the park, friend, with their friends eating, you know, brie, et cetera. So, but is there this comprehensive analysis of the Bloomberg administration? Because I think that he did so many, like, unsexy, quiet things to kind of help the city and keep it afloat. You know, he's like, listen, Gracie, he's like, Gracie Mansion's a dump. Let's do this. You know, when... God rest his soul. Ibrahim Abdul Mateen was on the podcast and explained to us about the third tunnel, you know, that Bloomberg sort of helped implement. And all the, you know, again, 311, I just got my water tested last month, people. It's for free. You just want to make sure it's also your civic duty to do so, to make sure that your building and your block and your neighborhood and your borough, um, you know, don't have any lead poisoning or or other issues with the water but like he implemented that he implemented 311 i mean before that it's just like alternate side of the street parking you're calling 911 to ask the police i mean that's like you know in elementary school we'd call our parents at work to ask if you could get a popsicle out of the freezer like you think about it it's like it's crazy that you used to just like call really important people for mundane things so he did a lot but then i just think he had like a real disdain for poor people at the same time not Robert Moses level, but just sort of either he didn't understand it, he was bristled by it, he was aloof to it. I think certain I think certain communities would say he was quite 
cruel. Um, I didn't have a pony in the race when it came to like public school and transfer. I was in good transportation line. I was in a highly voting neighborhood, you know? So like I was immune to some of cruelty of Michael Bloomberg, but I know enough people of color and poor people who were like, that man was the worst, not Giuliani level, but like a cousin. So where's that, where's that analysis? I'm curious. I'd love to have somebody like um, Howard Wolfson, who's a deputy mayor and just continues to be a senior advisor to Bloomberg, on to discuss this because it's a very impressive and steady legacy in a lot of ways, and I think a very problematic one in a lot of others. And this isn't just the stop and frisk stuff. I will note that the Perlman Performing Arts Center just opened right by the World Trade Center. This is the second half a billion dollar performing arts center that Bloomberg personally put over $100 million into. And that a big part of his vision, this place seats maximum like under a thousand people, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, And it is uh, it got this incredible front page above the fold New York Times thing about the rebirth of, of, of everything and the glory of this. I think this is a mayor Bloomberg who believed that, uh, first off, who flipped the usual dynamic and instead of politicians getting paid off as we've been talking about, or the right. people doing so was paying off politicians. And Listen, expecting... and pastors, mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and rabbis, and yeah. moms. We didn't hear yeah. a peep. He, 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 he uh, <clears throat> reversed all the usual back and mm-hmm. forth flows in ways it took the press a long time to even start to catch mm-hmm. up with. Mm-hmm. And he also, I think, really believed in um, a luxury city investing in extremely expensive, you know, nominally for the public arts centers, <clears throat> that are necessarily elite and saying the money's gonna gonna trickle down and flow down from there in ways I, I did don't entirely buy and I don't think are healthy. Um however, we're now a decade into fully democratic mayors after a 20 year interregnum. Mm-hmm. There's tons to dig into there. It's not gonna be on this podcast because I know I know we're nearing the end. Uh, and to think about, and I, I I think having Bloomberg folks on and Bloomberg critics on to just stop and step back and consider those 12 years, this isn't going to be a book or the final look, uh, but it's a very useful moment a decade later to uh, to do that and, uh, and reflect on it. Yeah, I agree. Um... In the meantime, look, those leaves, it's awesome. It's New York State doing this. It's all volunteers who are just reporting like what color the leaves are around them. You go there and you look. And you start dreaming, oh, I want to see, I want to see the golden ones here, you know? Oh, it's a really big state. You go half an hour outside the city and it's something else and it's glorious. Oh. Oh, I'm going to put on a little Nat King Cole as the leaves fall by my window. Um, we'll get to Puffy at some point. I mean, listen, this guy, talk about a book that needs to be written. Um, Harry, as always, I love spending time talking politics. Katie will join us next week. Um, that's all I got, friends. Autumn Leaves, it's actually based on a French song. I know the English lyrics are by Johnny Mercer, but beautiful. Bye. Bye. F-A-Q. This has been FAQ NYC. We're a part of the city, a nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom dedicated to hard-hitting reporting that serves the people of New York. Our work is freely available to everyone at thecity.nyc and is supported by listeners and readers like you. Go to thecity.nyc slash give if you'd like to pitch in. We also receive support from PNT Knitwear, an independent bookstore, cafe, and event space on Manhattan's Lower East Side with a podcast studio that can be freely reserved for community use. We're a proud member of the Brickhouse Cooperative of independent journalists, critics, and artists. Find it all at Popula.com and are affiliated with the Colin Powell School at CUNY City College, where Chrissy Greer is one of the inaugural fellows. Our hosts this episode were Professor Greer and Harry Siegel, who's also our executive producer. I'm our engineer, Adam Kamara. Thank you, listener, for joining us and making it this far. Be kind, be cool, and we'll be back soon with more.